The Lord spoke to us through a distinguished scholars, such as Dr. Heyong Kim Yu, Dr. Xiang Yang Ten, Dr. Tam Shanda, Dr. Guiwan Cho, Dr. Yong Ho Kim, and Dr. Cho Yong Chong. Uh, we learned a lot. We thank God what, uh, what he taught us through uh, his servants. Today, Dr. Grace Chison Kim and uh, Dr. Dennis Ockham, Dr. Kang Hak Lee, Dr. Eno Kim, Dr. Daniel Lee will speak on uh, spiritual formation from different perspective. After dinner, uh, there will be a panel session on the spiritual formation and the future of a Korean church, chaired by uh, Dr. Yuan Cho and Dr. Heung, Heung Yu and Dr. Kang Ak Lee and Dr. Sang Hyun Shim will serve as panelists. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us this uh, learning opportunity. Thank you for sending us, uh, sending your servants to us. And uh, thank you for teaching many things on uh, spiritual formation through your servants. Father, we commit today's speakers into your hands. Father, be with them and inspire them and speak uh, to us through them that we may better understand of spiritual formation and uh, we may get involved in ministry of a spiritual uh, formation uh, in your church for your kingdom. Father, receive glory and honor through these events and do your will uh, in and through us and through your speakers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we begin the, um, the first session today, I will make a brief announcement. Uh, translation is provided uh, through Zoom, so you need a, an access to Zoom, and you have a barcode up there. And we will have Q&A session right after the lecture. So if you are in the US, text your questions. And if you are outside the US, you have to send your questions through Zoom. And I will introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Grace Jison Kim. She is professor of theology at Earlham School of Religion, and she is really prolific writer. She wrote uh, and edited 21 books. I just counted it, and I was, you know, uh, it's impossible. And um, particularly, uh, his uh, her um, recent book, Invisible, was so so uh, influential, and she writes for many magazines such as Time, The Huffington Post, and Christian Century. And she has been exploring a lot of issues such as spirit and spirituality, and issues of Asian Christianity, and issues of women, in particularly in diaspora conditions. So uh, why don't we welcome uh, our uh, distinguished speaker. So bear with me. Uh, such an honor to be here with you all. Thank you to the director, uh, Dr. Um, Kim and Dr. Cho and everyone else at the center for this amazing conference. I think it's so important to have this kind of event. Um, you know, we Koreans are a small but a mighty country <laughs> and we are influencing the world in so many ways through our food, our language, our music, our um, drama, our K-drama. I always tell everyone my life is a K-drama. And I think through spirituality too, I think we can really, really make an impact in this world. So I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to come and share some of my um, findings and my research. 
So it's going to be based a lot on this one book that came out a few years ago, Reimagining Spirit. But um, and then once I got here, I thought. I'm going to delete some stuff. So there's a lot of materials that I deleted, but my respondent may talk about the stuff that I already deleted. And if we have time, we may go back. But I deleted a chunk of my presentation. I wanted to share a little bit about who I am. So I was born in Korea, and I um, went from kindergarten, Yuchun Sopto, Paksa, the whole thing in Canada. So from kindergarten all the way up to my PhD, I finished. And then 2004, we immigrated to the US. So these are the three kids that I have. So this was a picture that we took when we immigrated to the US in 2004. So um, just by their facial expressions, you can just imagine how much work they were <laughs> to raise. So a lot of work raising these uh, three kids. And um, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, like many Korean immigrants. So I went to a Korean Presbyterian Church. But then my parents, well, basically my dad, he would go to these revival services. So he took all of us to the revival services. And then during the week, uh, Friday nights, we went to some fellowship at a white um, community church. Sunday morning, we went to uh, Baptist Sunday School, and then we went to our afternoon Korean church, and then in the evenings, I went to another Baptist church for Sunday evening worship. So I am this kind of, uh, I have all these different influences within my own spirituality and growth. So this is a more recent picture of how they all look now in 2019. So I will begin um, by sharing and reading a little bit from my paper, and then I'll go on and talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. But I thought at the beginning, I just wanted to kind of uh, build a basis for this Korean spiritual formation. Even though I was born in Korea, um, as a child of an immigrant, and many of us, who were these young kids that came with their parents in the late 60s or in the 70s, many of us had a hard time because of the racism that was happening around us. So we did a lot of things, or at least myself, I did a lot of things to remove myself from the Korean culture. So not wanting to speak the Korean language uh, not wanting to look Korean, so I had girlfriends who dyed their hair or put um, scotch tape on their eyes to make their eyes bigger. So there was a lot of those things. And so growing up, my parents uh, dragged me and my sister kicking and screaming to Korean school. And I hated it. And then I said, if I have kids, I will never take them kicking and screaming to Korean school. But guess what? I took them all kicking and screaming every Friday night to Korean school because now it has come around that it's so important to know my own heritage, learn the language, understand this Korean spirituality, which is so, so important. Yes? Oh, yes. Okay, okay, yes. <laughs> so I wanted to share that as I begin um, the spiritual journey. So Korean spiritual formation is an aspect within Korean Christianity. Spiritual formation occurs through the work of the Holy Spirit. And as a Presbyterian, uh, many people ask, you know, you guys don't really talk about the Holy Spirit, so why are you doing so much work on the Holy Spirit? But that'll be another lecture, why I moved to the Holy Spirit. Um, the Spirit regenerates and builds us into the image of Christ as the Spirit lives in us and empowers us to work for the building of the kingdom of God in this world. Koreans have a real deep spirituality. 
from their own long history of different religious practices and spiritual practices which have been part of our own culture, identity, and society. So I think it's really important to mention that because when African Americans do their theology and when Africans talk about their spirituality, they always say they were spiritual before the white missionaries ever came to Africa. So I really want to emphasize that we also, as Koreans, um, have this long history of spirituality. In Korean Christianity, much has been adapted from the white Western European understanding of the Holy Spirit. And that is what I was taught. And in seminary, that's what I was taught. It's in the last 15, maybe 10 years now that I'm trying to unpack everything that I was taught, either at home or in church or during my studies. So um, moving away from the white European um, Christianity and the understanding of the Holy Spirit may be an important journey for our own Korean spirituality. Um, perhaps it is important to study within Korean, Korea's own spirituality to define and work towards a deeper sense of spiritual formation which can arise from our own context. So in my own work, I have done um, trying to move away from whiteness because if you live here, and I know there are people in Korea listening, but here in America, in North America, I think the term whiteness, uh, we really need to unpack it and understand the impact it has made upon Christianity, okay? And how Jesus and everything else has been made white. So in my journey as a theologian and looking at spirituality and looking at how we can understand the Holy Spirit, um, I do search scripture. And within scripture itself, it's very clear about the spirit as wind, breath, light, and vibration. So I'm going to go into that at the end of the presentation. So spiritual formation is a popular term in today's context. Non-Christians, there's a lot of people in our society that talks about spirituality, spiritual formation. I'm not religious, but spiritual. We use those terms, so it's a very, very common term. It's embedded in our culture today. It has become almost like a new fad. Okay, and the younger generation feel that it gives them some freedom rather than associating themselves with a religion or a denomination. I think that's why so many ch people are not coming to churches. And we see that in the white uh, Christian community, but we're also seeing it within our own Korean community. So we really have to observe what's happening and how can we maintain our young people um, and even the older ones who are leaving um, to come and become spiritual uh, within the church. There is less rigidity being spiritual as people have a freedom of expression to their spirituality. So that's why so many kind of want to talk about spirituality without the denominational or the religious aspect. Spiritual formation refers to the various facets of spiritual growth journey of believers, resulting in different concepts and constructs for its definition. Some see spiritual formation as a restoration to spiritual disciplines and practices of the early church desert fathers whereas others view it as a discipleship process that believers must be part of. Spiritual formation helps bring genuine life changes within the body of Christ. 
So I think that's one thing that we have to remember when we're talking about spiritual formation, that it really changes us. And it also helps us build a sense of discipleship. So that's why when young people are saying they want to be spiritual without being religious, we want to remind people who have left the church, especially those who have left the church, that the spiritual formation that we are talking about in this context and beyond is really about changing our life within the body of Christ and this understanding of discipleship. It is indeed an important aspect to becoming followers and disciples of Christ. It is indeed an important aspect to becoming followers and disciples. Spiritual formation is a process that Christians want to engage in to help them in their daily life to understand God's presence and meaning in their life. So when I think about spirituality in Korea, it moves me to this new kind of understanding of even myself and how my parents and my grandparents, how we were spiritual um, before we even heard of the word Christianity or being becoming a Christian. There are variations among world religions in how one practices and lives out their religion, which then accordingly affects one's understanding and view of spirituality. Spirituality refers to a religious process of orienting oneself to the image of God. It is a life which is positioned towards the Holy Spirit and movement of the Holy Spirit. When we think about the different religions in the world, and I think many of us who go to seminary, you know, you're almost kind of a mandatory course might be on world religions. But when we study these world religions, some of them place a highest value on the individual. And we see that within Christianity and Islam, where they tend to place more emphasis on theology and less on ethics and action. So those religions believe that God is the fountainhead of ethical obligations and therefore the relationship between the individual and God is more important than the relationship between the individual to the other or to the community. So when there's an emphasis on theology than action, we have this vertical relationship that's more emphasized, and we see that within Christianity and Islam, rather than this horizontal. horizontal. So I'm talking in vague, in more general terms, and I'm not saying all Christians are like that, but generally we focus on this vertical relationship. Such religions focus on the personal consequences of fidelity to or violation of God's commands. As a result, concepts such as heaven and hell become very important, and they exist to reward or punish individuals. Okay? So we focus on these terms of heaven and hell. And those Christians who want to emphasize the horizontal relationship, I think one of the writers, Brian McLaren, will say, you know, Christianity is not this evacuation plan to go to heaven. You know, we do have a life here on earth to live. And so we want to ask ourselves, how can we live uh, faithfully and spiritually? And how do we build this spiritual formation? Individualistic religions tend to portray spiritual struggle to promote good and resist evil as a battle which happens between the material world that we live in and the immaterial realm of God. 
and the rewards God promises the righteous after death. In such individualistic religions, spirituality becomes a practice for a reward rather than a gift in and of itself. In this type of spirituality, it really values individuality and gives that individuality an immaterial foundation. The individualistic religion focuses too much on the inward and not so much on the outward society and communal life. So spirituality becomes a very personal exercise for private gain rather than helping and furthering the good of the community. In these instances, Theology without ethics can sometimes be reduced to a philosophical exercise without any praxis or any component of doing good for society or for each other. So that has, you know, I've been describing this individualistic religion, and when we think about Christianity and dualism and the Greco-Roman philosophy and how all that has influenced how Christianity was formed and shared and how it moved, you know, within Europe and all the European philosophers and theologians affecting how we understand Christianity, I think we need to kind of name it and understand it. However, the traditional religions of Korea are on the opposite side of the spectrum of the individualistic religions as they emphasize ethics over theology. Because their primary concern is the group or the community rather than the individual. The moral codes that govern interaction within the group are given higher priority over theology. Any, individual particular, any individual's particular relationship with the supernatural being is important primarily for the impact it has on the community or the cohesiveness of the group, the family or the larger community. So when we look at traditional Korean forms of spirituality, place, they place less emphasis on the personal rewards after death than on the impact on individual behavior can have on that person's family, village, or society. Both the individual and the community of which they are a part are composed of matter. This means there is less interest in overcoming the limitations of the material world and more interest in connections within the material world. This form of spirituality provides insight on how Christianity can deepen its own sense of spirituality and spiritual formation by focusing less on ethics, less on theology, and more on ethics. It reminds us that the community is important and that individuals become people due to the community. And as I write more theology, I find myself going back to Korean spirituality, Korean religions, and the Korean language. And, you know, I went to Korean school kicking and screaming and looking back, I wish I was a bit nicer to my parents. <laughs> and I wish I learned the Korean language better. But as a theologian, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, as a theologian, I told my kids, nobody, none of you guys go into theology, please. Uh, go into something like the sciences. So if you're in the sciences, and if you're doing biology, you can, it's so easy, well, it's not easy, but if you're going to teach a class, you know, it's more concrete. I remember my grade 13 
um, in Canada. We had grade 13. In my grade 13 biology class, you know, we dissected a cat. So you can dissect a cat and see where everything is. Within theology, you cannot dissect God. You cannot do that. So at the end of the day, we only have words. I think the Korean word is ono, right? Is ono the right word for Korean? Yeah, okay. Um, so words are so important. And that's why I go back and use so many kind of Korean words. And um, because um, the moderator had introduced the book Invisible, I used the Korean word uri. Because in that sense, it's almost this moving away from uh, the individual to the community. Because we Koreans, linguistically, you cannot say my house and my parents. You always say our house and our parents. That's the correct linguistic way. So I think when we're thinking about Korean spiritual formation, um, which focuses on community, it really helps us to get even a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit, which is part of the Christian Trinity. And Professor John Ahn is sitting here. He's an Old Testament scholar. And yesterday I had a question for him. And then we got so busy that I never got to the question. But I needed the question before today. But it's okay. I'm just going to talk about the Trinity and the Godhead and how we understand it within scripture. When we think about Trinity, it is a communal relationship in God. And this has implications on our journey of spirituality and journey of faith. It really challenges our conception of God and emphasizes the harmony of the three-in-oneness of God. It really tackles the spirit, which has been basically absent within the individualistic, Western, Eurocentric understanding of who God is. We don't really focus on the spirit. Many of us think it's like the step stepsister. We focus on Jesus, we focus on Christology and not so much on pneumatology. So for me, in my journey, in trying to bridge the gap between Asian spirituality, Asian and Korean uh, spiritual formation, I draw on um, different terms like Ki and other forms of Korean spirituality. And I won't go into detail, but to emphasize that when we're doing things like this, it is a form of hybridity. And we know from post-colonial uh, studies, hybridity is an important term. And if we're going to study Christianity, we must kind of say that it is a hybrid kind of formation that has happened. If you look in the Old Testament, hybridity has been occurring and within Christianity itself. So I think really digging into our own Korean spirituality and lifting it up and understanding how it can actually inform Christianity may be a helpful exercise. And I hope some of you may uh, be able to engage in that because many of you know Korean spirituality uh, way better than I do. And as a child of an immigrant where I wasn't really exposed to that, but only more through academically and not through the cultural practices, um, it does become a bit more difficult. So I hope that we can kind of engage in that form of spirituality to really inform our own spiritual formation. So I began by saying how important it is to study the Holy Spirit and understand who the Holy Spirit is. 
So the four terms I introduced at the beginning, and I think many of us are familiar with these terms, so it may just be a kind of a summary or a review for you, but I kind of want to still emphasize it because these are helpful ways to understand God's presence in the world. So spirit as wind, breath, vibration, and light. And we know that when you dig into the uh, scriptures, you will see these references throughout scripture. So spirit um, in, in the Bible as, in the Hebrew Bible as ruha. And when we think about um, ruha and how we see it, it occurs 380 times in the Old Testament but the phrase Yahweh Ruha is only um, Ruha Yahweh is only 27 times. And I think those are kind of important ways for us to understand um, the presence of God. When we think about who God is, there's also this interchangeability within the Old Testament and in the New Testament with the wisdom of God and the spirit of God. So these two terms, you can kind of interchange, and then we get a deeper understanding of who God is and the spirit. We also understand the spirit as a real life-giving spirit who gives fullness to life. And there's many Old Testament passages, uh, maybe the dry bones. There's a lot of these Old Testament passages that really help us to make this connection between the life-giving spirit and uh, ruha, and when we move into the New Testament with um, the word pneuma, um, the Greek word. So pneuma originally meant breath, this movement of air. And when we think about human beings, and I, because I took a lot of the material of chi out, but when we when we give birth to a child, you know, the only way we know that they're breathing is if they start crying. Then we know that they're alive and they're breathing. In the Old Testament passages, we know that God gave life to human beings by this breath, this wind, this movement of air that is so important in the scriptures. And you see that in both the old and the new. There's also the emphasis on um, the spirit um, as the giver of life. And we see that Jesus is often associated with the spirit, the mediator that comes between us um, and God, and how the spirit then is poured on to the whole community. The giver of life um, and so on. I think the kind of the important one that we Koreans may want to skip over is the understanding of spirit as mother. Um, this, I think because we in Korean Christianity, Korean spirituality, um, Korean pneumatology, where, you know, Christianity itself is so patriarchal. And so if we move away from the masculine terminologies, we get very uncomfortable. Okay? We don't want to use uh, feminine imagery or feminine nouns. So, but in, um, when we look through, we see this mother image, which becomes very helpful, especially for us women. Some theologians have said that perhaps we should move away from um, understanding God in terms of noun and rather move to use verbs. Because when we have these nouns for God, then it's going to perpetuate the patriarchal understanding of spirit, of Christianity, and who God is. So some theologians have said, why don't we move and talk about God as verb? 
And so when I use these terms of um, wind and light, breath and vibration, actually it does show God as movement. The God that, uh, that was with the Israelites and at the Red Sea was able to part the Red Sea as wind and breath. And um, the term that I think many of us in Christian spirituality may not be familiar or would want to embrace is spirit as vibration. But when we think about the spirit as vibration, the spirit is in all things. So God pours out God's spirit upon the earth. Um, the biblical passage, Joel 2.28, you know, I will pour my spirit upon all people. And we feel God's presence, so the wind and the breath. If you've gone to Hawaii, they will um, greet you with the word aloha. So ha means breath. And they are saying, we're sharing the breath of God with you. That's what aloha is. So this understanding of breath, that the spirit of God is in the breath, spirit of God is in the wind and the energy, and that the spirit of God as vibration that moves. And you may be thinking, well, that's so weird. But if we think about uh, the creation story, we know that God created the world through, through word. And we know word is vibration. The light, the spirit also is viewed as light. Light is vibration. So vibration shows us that nothing is static, that it is moving, that it is movement and moving. So, and... In pop culture, uh, you know, we talk about sending good vibes to people. You know, that's just a popular thing to say. When Pope Francis goes on a plane, he's always got his um, media team. And one time he, on the plane, said to them, can you please send good vibes to me, good vibrations? It is a popular kind of concept within our culture, um, and when we sing about it. But when we think about vibration within uh, this Christian realm, that God is present in this world through the Spirit, then the Spirit is within us. I teach at a Quaker school, and what Quakers like to say is, they have a phrase, um, that of God in everyone. They love to say that, that of God in everyone, recognizing that the Spirit of God is in within all of us. And that's what helps us in our spiritual formation. It really changes us how we become disciples and within the body of Christ. And then that will help us to move more towards the community and the ethics rather than the theology. So I think understanding um, who the Holy Spirit is and using these other terms like wind, breath, energy, vibration, I think may help us in this um, spiritual formation and may help us in our Korean spirituality. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, you know, if you have a questions, uh, text your questions. And we have a lot of people joining online as well. And if you have questions, uh, use your um, uh, Zoom link for questions. And our respondent will be Dr. Kyungnan So, she is an affiliate professor of Bible and Mission. She has been teaching Mission Theology at Fuller uh, Seminary for many years. She serves as a director of a company ministry where she um, creates uh, women's missional communities and she's developing a lot of spiritual formation there as well. Please welcome her. Yeah. 
제가 어, 이 글을 읽고 너무 가슴이 벅찼는데 그것을 여러분들과 나누기를 원합니다. 몇년전 어, 제가 선교신학 수업에서 박사과정에 있는 학생들과 줌으로 토론을 진행한 적이 있습니다. 그때 한국의 대형교회에서 부목사님으로 어, 사역하시던 목사님 한 분이 이렇게 고백했습니다. 저는 이제껏 성령님을 교회 내에서만 일하시는 분으로 생각했습니다. 성령께서 교회 밖, 온 세상에서 일하고 계신다는 사실에 충격을 받았습니다. 사실 저도 그 목사님의 이야기를 듣고 깜짝 놀랐고 어쩌면 그 목사님의 생각이 성령을 우리 몸 안에 그리고 교회 안에 가두는 경향을 가진 한국교회와 한인교회를 대표하고 있을지도 모른다는 생각을 했습니다. 그래서 한국 영성 형성을 이야기하기 위해 성령에 대해서 먼저 논의하는 것이 필수적이라는 생각을 했습니다. 김지선 교수는 읽기 쉽고 명확하고 통찰력 있는 이 시대 상황에 맞는 신학적 저술을 어, 바로 어, 그래서 보여주고 있습니다. 이 글에서 세계화의 억압적인 도전 속에서 서구의 전통적 성령 개념과 동아시아의 기 개념을 결합하여 혼종화된 성령론을 구축하는 것이 보여집니다. 성령, 기라는 신학적 작업을 통해 탈식민, 탈가부장제, 탈인종화된 기독교 담론과 삶의 방식을 향한 신학적 도전을 주고 있는 것을 볼수 있습니다. 한국에서 태어나서 자란 일세임에도 불구하고 조직신학이라는 서구 세계관에 기초한 신학에 더 익숙한 제 자신으로서는 성령 기에 대한 혼종화 작업이 처음엔 굉장히 어색하게 느껴졌습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 이러한 새로운 신학화 작업의 중요성과 필요성을 곧 깨닫게 되었습니다. 그런 의미에서 동양에 익숙한 개념인 기를 가지고 성령의 새로운 신학화 작업을 시도한 코리안 아메리칸 여성신학자 김지선 교수에게 경의를 표합니다. 서구의 성령 개념과 동아시아의 기의 개념을 결합하여 혼종화 작업을 통한 성령론을 구축하는 것의 목적이 우리를 기후정의, 인종정의, 젠더정의를 위해 일하도록 초대하는 것이란 주장은 저의 관심을 확 끌어버렸습니다. 지구의 시간이 얼마 남지 않았음에도 불구하고 생태계를 파괴하는 우리 인간의 삶의 방식에 좌절하고 인종의 차이에 기초하여 차별이라는 폭력으로 많은 사람들을 배제하고 억압하는 것을 무기력하게 바라보며 아직도 가부장적 계급구조 아래서 약자들이 신음하며 고통당하고 있는 이야기를 들으며 사는 가운데 성령 기에 대한 연구가 우리의 어두움에 어쩌면 빛을 비춰준다라는 그러한 어, 소망을 가질 수 있었습니다. 서구, 어, 서구 신학의 성령 개념과 동아시아의 기 개념의 혼성적 이해가 탈식민지적 관시, 어, 관점을 가질 수 있게 한다라는 이 의미를 어, 바로 김지선 교수의 글을 통해서 제가 깨닫게 되었습니다. 결국 김 교수가 성령 기에 대한 이해를 기반으로 하는 영성의 방향을 정의를 통하여 전 인류가 평화를 누리는 것으로 의도하고 있다라는 것 이것이 우리에게 너무나 중요한 의미를 주고 있다라고 생각합니다. 영성 형성은 그리스도인들이 자신의 일상생활에서 하나님의 임재를 경험하는 가운데 삶의 의미를 이해하며 그리스도를 따르는 것이고 영성 형성은 성령의 역사를 통해 일어나기에 성령을 한국 고유의 맥락에서 연구하는 것 이것은 중요합니다. 이런 맥락에서 김 교수는 동양의 기 개념과 성령을 어, 혼소, 
혼종성으로 결합하는 것이 한국의 영성 형성을 발전시키는 데 도움이 된다고 주장하면서 전반적으로 공동체에 초점을 맞추는 한국 영성 형성에서 기독교 삼위일체의 한 위격인 성령에 대한 더 깊은 이해가 도움이 된다라고 주장합니다. 그것은 서구 기독교의 초점이 너무 그리스도 중심으로 하는 개인주의적인 이해에 흘렀기 때문입니다. 동아시아의 상황에서 바람과 정신의 개념을 나타내는 동양적 개념, 개념인 생명에너지, 기를 검토하면서 김 교수는 기에 대한 동양의 개념과 성령에 대한 서구 기독교의 이해가 놀라울 정도로 유사하다는 라 것을 보여주고 있습니다. 기는 어디에나 있고 모든 생명체에 존재하고 있다라고 어, 이야기하고 있죠. 기는 파악하기 어렵고 모호하지만 우주를 하나로 묶어 응집력과 질서를 가져온 옵니다. 기는 초월적이면서도 내재적입니다. 결국 기는 조화와 아름다움, 치유를 가져다 주는 생명력으로 인체와 인간 사이, 지구 자체를 순환하는 조화로운 에너지로 인식됩니다. 김 교수는 동양의 기와 같은 개념이 세상의 여러 곳에서 발견되는데 기의 보편적 매력과 이해로 인해 영성 형성을 탐구하는데 기의 개념이 도움이 된다라고 이야기합니다. 이런 대화는 특히 식민지 지배에 의해 배제되고 침묵당한 사람들과 전통들의 목소리를 부여합니다. 김 교수는 탈식민지주의 이론으로서의 혼종성과 신학을 소개하는데요. 혼종성은 신식민주의적 중심부가 주변의 문화를 지배함으로써 주변부에서 발생한 탈식민 저항과 관련하여 새로운 문제적 개념으로 부상했습니다. 이는 서구 문화의 소비자로 여겨졌던 주변부에서 자신의 문화의 자생적 역동성과 창조성을 드러내려는 시도로 연결이 됩니다. 피에톨스는 세계화를 전 지구적인 혼합들을 부송, 어, 부상시키는 혼종화의 과정으로 정의하고 있고 또 이와 붙이는 서로 다른 문화가 뒤섞이면서 생기는 정체성의 이중성, 경계성, 중간성을 혼종성의 주요 특징으로 제시합니다. 그런데 이러한 인문학적 개념을 신학화 방법론으로 도입하여 헬라 철학을 기반으로 한 서구 신학의 중심부에 기라는 동양 철학의 개념을 가지고 성령론을 혼종화하는 작업을 김 교수가 수행했습니다. 김 교수의 주장은 결국 신학적 혼종성이 소외된 공동체의 정치적 주체성과 저항을 장려하고 그 공동체가 정체성의 경계 사이의 간극에서 온전히 살수 있도록 한다는 암시를 우리에게 주고 있습니다. 기와 비교하여 성령에 대한 기독교인들의 이해를 넓히고 풍부하게 하려는 김 교수의 시도는 성경적 성령론에 새로운 빛을 비추고 있다고 생각합니다. 성령 기에 혼종화된 이해는 자연세계와 조화를 유지하며 모두에게 생명을 주는 힘으로 우리를 인도하면서 인류를 하나로 이끌어 살아있게 합니다. 또한 성령기는 세상을 변화시키기 위해 우리 모두 안에 있는 성령기의 힘을 인식하도록 강조합니다. 성령기의 혼종화된 이해는 구원적인데 어, 이는 우리 사이의 한계 공간에 살고 있는 사람들을 구하기 위해 공간을 협상하기 때문입니다. 이런 개념이 우리에게 굉장히 중요하다고 생각합니다. 이것은 성령의 어, 서양의 성령과 동양의 기 사이의 제3의 공간에서 주변화된 사람들을 포용할 수 있다는 사실을 암시하고 있습니다. 
그래서 성령 기는 우리 인류의 상호 연결성을 깨닫게 해줍니다. 또한 우리가 단순히 타자를 무시할 수 없다라는 사실을 인식하도록 도전합니다. 성령 기는 해방적이고 포용적이며 총체적이고 상호문화적 공동체를 세우는 것으로 김 교수는 결론을 맺습니다. 기독교인들이 성령을 생명의 호흡으로 이해하고 동시에 동아시아의 사람들도 기를 생명의 호흡으로 이해하지만 여기서 저는 하나님의 영이시고 또 예수 그리스도의 영이신 성령이 성령 기의 신학에서 어떻게 기독론과 삼위일체론으로 연결될 수 있는가에 대한 질문을 가지게 됩니다. 성령은 우리를 예수 그리스도께로 인도함으로 궁극적으로 아버지를 드러내는 역할을 감당합니다. 그래서 서구신학의 성령론과 동양철학기의 유사성에 대해서는 전적으로 동의하지만 또 구별되는 부분들에 대한 질문은 계속해서 제 안에 남게 됩니다. 또한 많은 영들의 세상에서 성령을 다룰 때 우리 기독교인들에게 분별력이 필요하다라는 부분 이것도 우리가 간과할 수 없습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 동서양 사이의 공통성과 상호성을 찾기 위해 문화적 경계를 넘어 도달하는 것의 가치는 그 어느 누구도 부인할 수 없다라고 생각합니다. 결국 김 교수는 이 글을 통해 폭력적 세상을 치유하고 타자를 위한 공간을 마련하고 우리가 동의할 수 없는 사람들을 환대할 수 있는 신학적 비전을 우리에게 제시하고 있다라고 생각합니다. 이는 식민주의, 가부장제, 인종주의와 같은 힘의 논리에 의해 폭력과 억압을 조장하는 것에 대한 반대 세상을 꿈꾸는 것이라고 말할 수 있습니다. 이것이 바로 거꾸로 뒤집어진 하나님 나라의 새로운 질서에 대한 비전이기도 하다라고 이야기하고 싶은 것입니다. 우리 한인 디아스포라뿐 아니라 한국 사람들의 영성의 방향이 김 교수가 추구하는 이 신학적 비전을 품고 나가는 것이 될때이 세상에서 일하시는 성령의 사역에 우리는 동참할 수 있습니다. 이미 한국도 이제는 이주민들에 대한 사역 이주민들이 들어오고 있고 그들과 함께 신학화 작업을 하고 있을 뿐만이 아니라 우리 이 한인 디아스포라들도 계속해서 우리의 상황 속에서 신학화 작업을 수행하고 있습니다. 이런 상황 속에서 기득권을 사수하는 것, 약자를 억압하는 것, 타인을 배제하는 것으로부터 떠나 모두를 포용함으로 인류가 함께 평화를 누리는 방향으로 나가는 영성이 우리에게 정말 필요한 것이 아닌가 생각합니다. 특별히 한국교회와 한인교회가 이원론적이 아닌 통합적 영성, 차별이 아닌 포용적 영성, 폭력이 아닌 평화의 영성을 회복할 수 있게 되기를 간절히 소망합니다. 我will begin the questions and answer session, and I will take a look at the questions here. Okay, Dr. Kim, would you respond to Dr. Sir's question about how we can connect what you suggest suggested to a Christology? Because you know your suggestion is more focused on the spirit, which is already you know who is already there. But what about Christology? How can we make a connection between them? Okay. Yep, so sorry with my limited Korean. I didn't understand everything, but it was so good. Um, she covered all the stuff that I actually took out of the paper because I was a little concerned about uh, the content. But anyway, you covered most of it, and I understood 
uh, most of it, but not fully. Uh, for me, um, my first book was called The Grace of Sophia, and I did wisdom Christology. I was trying to do uh, move away from this maleness of who Jesus is. Um, because, you know, you can talk about Christ. If you talk about the historical Jesus, you can go, go to the maleness. But if you talk about Christ, you don't need to. But then already in Scripture, there is this wisdom understanding of, of the child of God. And then Jesus is understood as a wisdom. And if you look at the original languages, wisdom is always feminine. So I was really overjoyed by that. I thought, I don't know why we never kind of did this more deeply within the church. However, um, after I did that book, I realized uh, we have we had in, in our seminary some Muslim students and other Buddhist students who wanted to come and learn about Christianity. And if you're going to enter into any form of dialogue with those who are outside of your Christian faith, it's really difficult to enter through Jesus Christ. <laughs> because it's going to be a stumbling block. But it becomes really easy if you start talking about the spirit. Because within many of these other world religions, they have an understanding of the spirit. So in my work, when I'm doing, you know, you, you did a lot of the stuff that I took out. But when you're talking about chi, you know, I went to Africa. And you, if you speak about chi... They know exactly what you're talking about. And they will say they have their own word for chi. If you go to Australia, same thing. So if you go to the different parts in South America, everybody has this other word for spirit. And so the spirit then becomes a good way for us to be in conversation with one another and love one another. You know, that's the greatest commandment. So I think it becomes an easier way for us to engage in the community, which is what I began, that, you know, when we're talking about spiritual formation, it really needs to deal with the community. It can't be just this vertical relationship with God. So then linking that with Jesus, I think, you know, Jesus is understood as the Spirit, you know, we just had Easter. We're going to have Pentecost soon. You know, Jesus says, I will pour my spirit upon you. So I think it just becomes an easy link. And the spirit, you know, the, some will say the first 2,000 years of Christianity is all about Jesus. The next 2,000 years is going to be all about the spirit. But we don't know. But anyway, I think the spirit is this kind of language that helps us to engage with those who are different from us and helps us also to overcome this maleness um, which Christianity is so fixated in. So the spirit language becomes very helpful in that way. I don't know if I answered all of your question. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can raise your questions here. So, uh, anyone? Okay. If not, I. Uh -huh. Each country has a different context of culture and everything. But is it okay to replace all the terminology of speech, uh, theological terminology into the world that we, our culturally understanding world? Is it? Is it okay? Or yeah. still kind of there's some dangers or misleading into um, some sort of like a danger part of the, you know, dangerous part of the like, mm -hmm. the originality of theology, you know, purity, yeah. you know? Yeah, so I, you know, that's a very good question. It's an important question. But when we think about, you know, I did emphasize that as theologians, we only have words. Right? So language is important. And when Christianity emerged, you know, it, it, the Hebrew Bible uh, written in Greek, so we had Greek words, so we had pneuma. In the Old Testament, we had the Hebrew word ruha. But then as Christianity spread into Europe, um, German theologians didn't keep using pneuma. They just said, okay, we're going to use geist. We're going to use that 
for um, because they're speaking now and doing theology in German language, and in the French they use their own uh, spiritus or whatever language. In the Latin they use their own la language. In English now we use spirit. So English has become this dominant theological language, but that's very recent. We always had French and German. So I think for the last two thousand years. It was white male European theologians who did it. We're living in a globalized world. People are speaking multi-languages. And Korean Christianity is, or has been growing, and has been influential. Korean missionaries are going all different parts of the world. So if Koreans are influencing, either through food or K-drama or music, we're going to be eventually influencing Christianity. And we speak Korean, so why can't we use our Korean language? So like That's a, the reasoning. Yeah. yeah, so replacing, you know, so understanding our like a spirituality, mm -hmm. spirit mm -hmm. as a key, right? Mm -hmm. So what if that's the kind of sound direction for Korean kind of spiritual formation of the you know from the Korean church, right? What other kind of world or theological terminology that you guys try to replace right now too for the better understanding of like a Korean context, you know? Not only spirit, but uh -huh. like a, you know. Okay, so the other term, so in in the book Invisible, I use uh, I think five terms. So the ones are Chong, Udi, Han, Ki, and. Maybe it was four. I can't remember now. <laughs> but I use Chong because when we think about the language of love, in the English language, it's so limiting. We just say love and that's about it. But the Greek had the other words, uh, filio, agape, um, eros. So different languages, when you bring them all in, it becomes so helpful. So when Koreans use Chong, and white people who's never heard of that word, or it can be African Americans or Spanish speaking, they find that so helpful. Because when we are doing theology or when we're going to church and we're worshiping God, we're these finite beings who are worshiping the infinite. We will never understand the fullness of God. And you know, if you study any of the earlier thinkers, Augustine said, if that is God, if you think that is God, that is not God. That's to say, we only try to understand God. We will never know the fullness, so we use as many languages and terms and concepts as possible to help us. You know, at the end of the day, I only, you know, I can basically just do grade five, I mean, kindergarten Korean. So I'm gonna do it in English, but I can use these terms to help. And, you know, this happens with the Native Americans. You know, when the Native Americans have been living here for thousands of years, white people came and they settled, they colonized, there, there was a genocide. 98% of the population have been killed. Now, many of these Native Americans are trying to reclaim their spirituality and one of them is um, Caitlin Curtis. She wrote a book called Native. And she said, one of the ways to reclaim their spirituality is to learn their language. She had to learn her language, the native language. And many of them are now disappearing because the white people said it's all evil. You can't speak your language, speak English, etc." And she gave an example. In her language, the term for Americans is a white man with a long sword. That's a totally different image from what we have as an American. But that's in her language, the Native American language, and I can't remember which tribal language it is right now. That's, and that gives us, wow, that is more truer image of an American than what we may have right now. So I think words always help us. It helps deepen our understanding and our spirituality. And if we as Koreans have been using the term key and Africans have been using other terms, um, Indians use pana, you know, uh, in Hawaii they use ha, like the breath. I think those words really deepen our understanding. That's why when we go to public school, in America, we say you have to learn Spanish. In other countries, you have to learn, I don't know, Latin and French. But I think the more languages and the concepts that we have, it really deepens it. And we shouldn't be afraid because 
theologians have been doing it for the last 2,000 years, we shouldn't be afraid of ourselves and our own language and our concepts. And if we are, that's the whiteness that is making us afraid. And that's really embedded. Dr. So, uh, you can, you can add. 예, 저도 한 가지 이야기를 하고 싶은데요. 저는 질문에 대한 직접적인 대답이라기보다는 어, 제가 한국에서 아, 한국 사람으로서 굉장히 컨설버티브한 그 교단에서 자랐어요. 그렇기 때문에 항상 어, 옳은 게 뭔가 correct 이게 중요했고 옳지 않은 거에 대해서는 생각하지 말아야 했고 어, 그런 어떤 생각을 가지면서 어, theology 신학에 대해서도 어떤 절대적이라는 그런 어떤 개념들이 저한테 있었어요. 근데 제가 공부를 하면서 그 개념들이 다 부서져 내리는 거예요. 왜냐하면 어, 서양 사람들의 서구 헬라 철학의 기반으로 해서 이 신학화가 이루어졌기 때문에 이미 헬라 세계관이 신학의 밑바닥으로 들어가고 있는 거죠. 그것을 우리는 요 어떤 절대화된 신학으로 받아들인 거예요. 그리고 그것이 혼합 적인 성격을 띠게 될때 우리가 굉장히 두려움을 가지게 되거든요. 왜냐하면 제가 그랬어요. 그랬는데 제가 공부를 하는 가운데 성령께서 저에게 어, 알려주신 것이 뭐냐면 두려워 말라라는 거. 두려워 말라라는 거. 제가 잘못된 길로 가고 있을지라도 성령께서 나를 또 다시 길로 진리 가운데로 인도하실 거라는 거예요. 그러, 그리고 내가 어, 신학이 절대적이다. 그리고 이것이 어, 혼합되는 것을 두려워서 아무 시도도 하지 않고 그 가운데서 약자들을 배제하고 그들을 사랑하지 못한다는 것 이것은 더큰 죄라는 것 이런 것들을 제가 개인적으로 경험할 수 있었어요. 그런데 이것을 우리가 경험할 수 있는 것은 아마도 여자라는 것 그리고 제가 한국에 있었으면 이것을 아마 깨닫지 못했을 수도 있습니다. 그러나 미국에 와서 마이너리티로 산다라는 것 그리고 여자라는 것 이런 약자의 개념에서 신학을 공부를 하면서 얼마나 놀라운 것들을 많이 보게 됐는지 몰라요. 우리 하나님은 배제하시는 하나님 아니시고 포용하시는 하나님이시고 그리고 우리가 옳고 그른 것을 결정하는 것보다 정말 우리가 서로 사랑하는 것, 이 사랑을 이루는 것 이것이 정말 더 원하시는 하나님이시라는 그 하나님을 깨달아가게 될때 자유가 생기더라고요. 그래서 신학화 작업을 하는데 자유가 생기고 또한 가지는 저는 뭐 신학자 그렇게 학구적인 사람이 아닙니다. 그런데 제가 이 책을 읽고 너무나 환호했던 것 중에 한 가지는 제가 수업을 하면서 한국적인 신학이 뭐냐고 너희는 어떤 식의 신학화 작업을 했냐라고 이야기를 할때 대답할 수 있는 게참 없었어요. 그런데 이러한 시도가 이곳저곳에서 일어나고 있다는 것이 너무나 감사합니다. 이것이 절대적이라는 것이 아니에요. 그렇지만 우리가 자유를 가지고 신학화 작업을 해나갈 수 있다는 것 우리의 상황 속에서 그것을 벌써 한국 문화에서는요 케이팝, 그쵸? 한류 문화 이런 것들로 해나갔어요. 그런데 우리가 신학에 있어서는 왜 그것이 안 될까요? 왜 우리는 두려워할까요? 우리가 물론 제가 우리 여기 와 계신 커스틴 김 교수님한테 제가 배운 게한 가지가 있는데요. 뭐냐 하면 분별력을 가지는 거예요. Discernment. 이것을 가지고 성경을 의지하면서 나간다면 이러한 신학화 작업이 우리에게 필요하고 이것이 우리를 제대로 된 영성, 포용하는 영성 이쪽으로 우리를 이끌어줄 수 있지 않을까 하는 정말 귀한 어, 경험을 하게 됐습니다. 
So I can think of um, Lamin Stane, you know, uh, who mentioned about translatability. You know, in terms of the history of Christianity, you know, uh, beginning from uh, 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 Jewish uh, uh, framework, then Hellenistic framework, and then you know, uh, on and on and on. So we can think of uh, this issue in terms of that transla translatability. So, if you have any, any other question, you can raise your question. I have a few comments, yeah. but I know we're running out of time. And uh, it's Grace, huh? Dr. Kim. <laughs> First, I want to affirm. And thank you, Kamsam Nida, for the out-of-the-box thinking to help us to think more widely. And I know we've always been conscious, not always, but much more conscious in recent years, especially in the recent couple of years and so on, of how white supremacy, white culture and so on has dominated many areas of our lives, including theology. And we need to be, um, what shall I say, uh, appropriately critical of that. Um, on the other hand, I, I, I do have one of, a couple of comments because I've written a lot about the Holy Spirit and counselling and mental health and so on. And uh, while I affirm that the feminine aspects okay, uh, of even Christ himself, if you look at Christology, if you look at Jesus, the character of Jesus, the many characteristics that Jesus evidenced and the fruit of the Spirit that are not particularly male or, 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 or white. Yeah, yeah. In other words, we can come to Scripture what I'm advocating for is to continue to be founded in our biblical roots with an open mind to learning from culture. But you mentioned spirit, you mentioned a key, you mentioned I'm Chinese, okay, all this. I understand all that. I grew up in Singapore. I didn't become a Christian until I was 14. I understand the Buddhist background, the other backgrounds. And we have to acknowledge indigenous uh, cultures, indigenous theologies. I have no problems with that. But it is very important to still be biblically grounded because there's one aspect of spirit we haven't talked about. There's demonic spirits too. There, there, there are things that can be dangerous. And so we need to discern, not with white theology necessarily. We have to critique that when it's inappropriate and wrong, really. Okay, so I'm with you there. However, there's a biblical core of truth. So in John's Gospel, for example, the Holy Spirit, okay, Jesus says, I'll send you the Spirit, the teacher of all truth. I'll teach you all truth and bring all things to your remembrance, what I've said unto you, and he'll exalt me. See, the Spirit's work in, in Christology, Jesus, the centeredness is connected, and of course the Father, the triune God, all three in one, you see. You know all that, you're a theologian, you know? So I want to, to just affirm what you said, but just a couple of comments about the need to still continue to be biblically grounded, and otherwise, you know the danger, and I, I'm not accusing you of that, I'm saying, right, it's syncretism. After a while, you know, yeah. I, yeah, and so, I know, uh, yeah, I know you were going to get to syncretism. And, and, I, and I know yeah. you're not going there. I, yeah. I know that. I just want to, yeah. I, I did not get that sense from you. Mm -hmm. But I, I need to bring this up because of some, on the other hand, there's something. Yeah. So, so you may want to address some of that. Yeah. Yes, I think, you know, what your comments is so important. I think when you're going to try to go biblically, yeah, the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit. So if you are bearing those fruits... You know, that's one way to find out. When we're also talking about Jesus, Jesus was not white. But somehow, Christianity made him white. And in turn, God is white too. So that, you know, and people will say, well, it's biblical. There is no, no biblical reference of Jesus being white. He was born in Bethlehem, you know, um, Palestinian Jew. He was not white. But we do this. And so already, this syncretism if you want to use the term, has been happening from the birth of Christianity under the Roman Empire. It was, a, you know, they were living under colonialism. So understanding all of that historical context and how the scriptures were even written, they weren't written at the time of Jesus, but after Jesus. So people's recollection and also you know, it was male dominated. So understanding all of that and how women's uh, names were changed to male and women's names weren't recognized. I think understanding all of these problems will help us to say, okay, we are mere human beings. Somehow we have canonized the Holy Book, the Holy Bible, and we revere it, we, we turn to it when we're preaching and teaching and reading and for our own spiritual formation, but recognizing also that we are human beings, we are finite, 
and we have failures, just like all of us. We are trying. This is a journey. We're not saying this is the truth. I don't think that is even very clear within Scripture. The disciples are so confused about who Jesus is. They don't understand Jesus. They can't believe that he will die and rise from the dead. So, so much confusion even amongst the people that were with Jesus. I think recognizing all of that, I think, helps us because then it, we really surrender to God and we ask, please come and help us. As those who have suffered under patriarchy, have suffered under this whiteness, you know, there are so many, this intersectionality of, of oppression here that we're experiencing in the U.S. and beyond. I think we really need to recognize that. And as human beings on this theological journey, on this spiritual journey, how are we going to lift people up? Because people are depressed. They are oppressed. They are committing suicide. They don't know how to turn. You're doing the psychology. I'm not doing that. But when we recognize all this brokenness, we can't just say okay, this is Christianity that the white Europeans have given to us because that has continued. Because I want to say one thing, and then you can go on. When we read scripture, we have to be very careful because in the past, scripture has been used to enslave Africans here, to cause um, genocide against the Native Americans. Uh, women have been subordinate, etc. So we have to be very careful when we're doing scripture because all of that scripture has been used to murder and to engage in war. Um, so we are just really running out of time, <laughs> Dr. Tan. So we have other we can sessions. Talk more so, uh, one to one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll have this uh, discussion. You know, uh, after that. You know, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I understand in this country there's a lot of that and you are really responding or reacting to that. I, I say amen to you need to mm-hmm. critique that. Okay? Okay. But there's still a biblical corpus of truth that goes beyond the white theology and that you are trying to develop in some ways say amen to that. And you go back again to that. So my, my concept is that neontology, histology and so on deeply connected. Mm-hmm. And the Holy Spirit needs to help us with all this. So that's my last word. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, please uh, give your hands to our uh, uh, speakers. So we will have a 15-minute break, or 15 or 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We have 10-minute break. Um, DMIS and DIS alumni provided coffee and refreshment. Thank you uh, for your provision.